tēnā koutou katoa. E te mana whenoa tēnā hoki koutou. Ko ao te tumu tūrua o te whare wānanga o Waitaha. Ko Ian Wright, taku ingwa. Kia ora. Welcome. My name is Professor Ian Wright and I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor at the University of Canterbury and it is my great pleasure to welcome you, the audience, to the panel discussion tonight on land use, climate change and how we can respond to new pressures and new possibilities. Uh, for me this is particularly relevant given we are now here in Christchurch in Canterbury where we have a technology-enabled city sitting at the edge of a large, prosperous agricultural hinterland. We have an opportunity to answer the question uh, posed around the panel discussion. It is also my pleasure um, to uh, host this evening along with the New Zealand Greenhouse Gas Research Group. Uh, the university would also like to acknowledge the New Zealand government through various agencies along the bottom of the banner here um, for their support uh, and Naitahu uh, who are hosting the wider IPCC climate meeting here in Christchurch. Tonight's event is being recorded so you're on film um, and will be able to be accessed via the Royal Society Tapa Aparangi uh, website in a few days time. Now here's the sort of uh, the doors message. In the event of a, an emergency the exit doors are front uh, left and right and also rear left and right and the assembly point is out in the park so hopefully we don't need to do that but um, that's the procedure. 2018 marks the 30th year of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and it is my pleasure to introduce our MC for the evening, Veronica Maduna, an award-winning science journalist well known for her work with Radio New Zealand and the conservation. So please join me in welcoming Ver Veronica. Thank you very much for that, and uh, thank you also for dealing with all the housekeeping, which <laughs> seems to me to do that. Thank you all for coming too. If I look across the audience, there's a wealth of expertise there too. Um, but big thanks to our panellists tonight. They've all come here, some of them across very large distances, to spend a week here for an authors' meeting for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change on this particular report and land use. And that week has been busy and intense enough as it is, so I really appreciate them taking the time out for this discussion tonight. This session, as um, Professor Wright has mentioned, was being recorded, and the format will run as there'll be a brief presentation first, and then we'll launch into the discussion. So I will introduce the panellists at that point when we start the discussion. But let me first introduce our first speaker tonight, Professor Jim Ski. He's the co-chair of the IPCC's Working Group 3. That's the group that deals with climate change mitigation. This is all the actions we can take to reduce, limit greenhouse gas emissions and slow the rate of climate change. He's also the UK's Research Council's Energy Strategy, excuse me, Energy Strategy Fellow and based at the Imperial, at Imperial College London. And in this role, he helps the UK Research Councils to decide where to put their funds for energy research. So before we get on with the discussion, let me ask Jim to come up and he'll give us a brief overview of the IPCC's work on this land use report. Kia ora, and uh, thanks very much, uh, Veronica. I, I should just say before I, before I say a few words that we really very much welcome the hospitality that we've been shown here in New Zealand. I won't mention all the groups on the slide here, but I would particularly mention Naitahu and the splendid hospitality they, they showed us last night for, for a dinner. 
Now, I'm just going to say a few words about what IPCC is for and why we're here. Our job is to assess all the scientific, technical and socio-economic information relevant to climate change, including impacts on human beings and ecosystems and the options that we have for, for dealing with it. I should emphasize that we don't do our own research. We assess other people's research and we don't make specific recommendations to policymakers. We offer them options uh, so that they can make their own choices about what to do. Uh, Ian has already mentioned we've been around for 30 years. Uh, our first report influenced the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. The second one fed into the Kyoto Protocol. And the fifth report fed into the Paris Agreement, uh, which came over, uh, out over just over two years ago. Now, our outputs are quite daunting. Every cycle, we produce three reports. Uh, one on physical science, one on impacts, and one on mitigation. And each of these is the size of a telephone directory. They each have roughly the same number of words as war and peace. Uh, I should emphasize, however, that Tolstoy did not get a Nobel Prize, and IPCC did. But we did not get the Nobel Prize for literature, I, I, I think, I, think I, I should emphasize. Now, this cycle is a little bit different because the governments have asked us to produce three special reports. One on global warming of 1.5 degrees that follows from the Paris Agreement. One on oceans and cryosphere, that's basically glaciers and ice sheets. And one on climate change and land. That's the short title. You can see the long title up on the screen in front of you, which, is, which from memory is the special report on climate change, desertification, land degradation, sustainable land management, food security, and greenhouse gas fluxes in terrestrial ecosystems. And thank you. Now, that reflects the diversity of views of the governments that actually came in and wanted this report to be written. Many countries, you know, in arid regions concerned about desertification, but other countries like New Zealand and Ireland much more concerned about agricultural prospects, what could be done about food systems. So it is a very diverse report. And that's reflected in the background of the 120 scientists who've gathered here in Christchurch this week. We are preparing a draft of the report for expert review, and then another meeting in Ireland, which will take place later in the year, we'll prepare a report for review by governments. So we are having a, a very productive time here. Uh, we always have a challenge midweek, but we will pick ourselves up over, over Thursday and Friday. And in the meanwhile, I should stop at this point and pass over to the experts on the panel. So thank you, Veronica. Thank you very much for that. Now that leaves me now to introduce our panellists briefly. Um, then we'll have a discussion and there will be time for your questions at the end of that. To my furthest right, to your left, Professor Tim Benton as Dean of Strategic Research Init Initiatives at the University of Leeds and Distinguished Visiting Fellow at the Energy, Environment and Resources Department at the Royal Institute of International Affairs at Chatham House. Until recently, he was the champion of the UK's Global Food Security Programme, and I'll ask you to explain in a minute what the champion means. Um, this is a multi-agency partnership between government departments and research councils whose goal is to support research that lessens the challenges of providing enough nutritious and sustainably produced food for all. So you can see the tensions between climate change, food production, food security. Um, his academic work, and there's plenty of papers that he's published, tackles topics such as agriculture's environmental impact and how systems respond to environmental change. Next to Tim, Professor Annette Cowie has a background in soil science. She's the principal research scientist for climate in the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries. So her background is in soil science, plant nutrition, sustainable resource management, before her current role, she was Director of Rural Climate Solutions, which is a partnership between the New South, Wales, New South Wales Department of Primary Industries and the University of New England. And it is also a task leader of the International Energy Agency Bioenergy Research Network and an advisor on land degradation on the Scientific and Technical Advisory Panel of the Global Environment Facility. 
and she's a member of the science policy interface of the UN's Convention to Combat Desertification. In her previous role before that, for the New South Wales, New South Wales DPI, Annette investigated the services of planted forests from greenhouse gas mitigation, stripping CO2 from the atmosphere to land rehabilitation. Then Dr. Fatima Denton is the director of the UN Economic Commission for Africa's Special Initiatives Division. She's published extensively on renewable energy, sustainable development, climate change, gender issues, climate change adaptation, vulnerability, food security, and water and energy poverty. She has served as a lead author for the IPC's working group two. This is on impacts on adaptation during the last assessment round and for the IPCC special report on renewable energy sources and climate change mitigation. In 2016, she was nominated by the Bullock Dialogue International Symposium as one of the women leaders driving agricultural transformation in Africa. And then Associate Professor Anita Rayford is an applied economist at Lincoln University's Agribusiness and Economics Research Unit specializing in agricultural economics and responses to climate change. She is a lead author for the IPC's Working Group 3, and her expertise lies in economic evaluations of adaptation options across various sectors, and mitigation options and costs in agriculture. In addition to the IPCC, Anita has also worked for the EU Commission, the OECD, Scottish Government's Climate Exchange Program, and the UK's Committee on Climate Change. Now, with the introduction to this land use report, we've already heard that the IPC has, has been has 30 years behind it on discussing climate change. The land use report is a special report to be published next year, looking at the role land will play in how we deal with climate change. And it will be a crucial role, the way we use land, what we grow on it, how we protect it, how we restore it, even who owns it. They're all issues that matter. And I would like to open the discussion with a broad question to all of you. From your various areas of expertise, where do you see the pressure points and the opportunities? Because there will be both. And could I start locally with Anita? Sure, thank you. Well, as you said, we use land for everything. We use it to grow our food, we use it for our energy, we use it for where we live. So it's a vitally important part of our lives. And in New Zealand, it's especially important. As, as most of you know, it's a vital um, sector of the economy. Um, but it's also a really one of our selling points in terms of our clean, green image, our tourist um, reputation. So it's critical. And I think so. this report, and particularly the, chapters that, the chapter that I'm involved in, is understanding how we make decisions um, and how these affect the implications and the trade-offs for the environment and land. So in New Zealand, we're starting to tackle some of these issues at the moment, and we can see where these challenges are coming up. But I think it's a real opportunity to show leadership in this area for New Zealand. Like, we are already leaders in understanding agricultural emissions, but where we're not leaders is taking action and reducing them and other forms of um, emissions reduction. So it's an opportunity for New Zealand to really um, take a stand um, also to address the impacts of climate change. We're only really beginning to do that. And really, I think it's an opportunity to transform some of our existing systems so that not only we're addressing climate change impacts um, and uh, reducing our emissions, but we're also getting multiple other benefits, such as water quality, increasing our biodiversity, and, and improving our communities as well. So I see it as an opportunity. Great. Do you want to pick up, Fatima? Thank, thank you. Um, yeah, I think um, Anita talked about the the importance of land, and um, land is a is the essence of um, civilization. Um, it's the essence of our humanity as well. Um, and just to say that in the context of Africa, I mean, people depend on land so much more. Um, it's really tied to a survival process. Um, but where I see the pressure point is, um, it's not necessarily, I mean, you were talking about new pressures, it's not necessarily new, it's the amplification of these processes. Um, in other words, um, Africa has got a number of particularities in the sense that 
it is perhaps one of the only region where we're witnessing a uh, population explosion. At the same time, we are also witnessing a deficit in terms of yields. Um, and these things are happening at the same time. Um, we are seeing um, land being degraded. Um, you know, there are, there are places in Africa where you can't even, you know, livestock and people can't even, um, cattle and all that can't graze because there is no space for grazing. There is no water. Um, you know, ecosystems are being depleted, um, our rivers are degraded. Um, so these sort of biophysical processes are happening. Um, and whilst they're happening, they are also um, creating a lot of um, insecurity, human-related insecurity. So we're seeing a lot of um, um, problems related to migration. Um, I mentioned the, the um, demography um, in terms of population growth. Um, and um, the, the, these, um, these mega, mega trends are actually quite, um, they're actually quite worrisome. Um, but again, I think the, the point, the other point that I wanted to mention is um, the fact that um, um, Africa is one of the regions also that has the youngest, con I mean, it's the youngest continent, 60% um, um, of the current population is under the age of 30. Um, so I'd like to believe that this is going to be the region that will bear the responsibility of climate change perhaps the longest um, and therefore has maybe even the greater burden of this responsibility in terms of how it deals with it. Um, and in that sense, I do see an opportunity. Um, and, and here there are several opportunities um, to mention. I mean, being the youngest continent also means that, um, you know, there is, we talk about a youth bulge where you're going to have a great deal of entrepreneurial energy coming from the youth uh, that can actually begin to invest in land in a way that we haven't done in the past. Um, we talk a lot about climate smart agriculture, um, and I think that there is a lot of potential investment in this area uh, with youth um, um, beginning to see just how attractive um, this can be in terms of uh, um, potential investment. Um, and then just very quickly to say um, that um, beyond that also, um, this is also a region that even though it's quite rich in a number of renewable energy sources, it's also quite poor in terms of the deployment of these renewable sources. Um, and I think that here again, there is a potential opportunity um, for the youth to be able to take advantage of this. Um, again, in terms of um, entrepreneurial activity, but also because we are talking about the need for us to transition into a new climate economy, um, a new climate economy that we're going to have to configure differently um, a new climate economy that doesn't allow us to go through some of the mistakes that you have made um, in the sense that we now have a brand new opportunity um, to work towards um, an economy that we can configure differently. We don't have to industrialize quite in the same way that you have industrialized. Um, and we can avoid uh, many of these locking effects that we know is caused by technology and capital. Um, so therefore, I think we have a brand new opportunity to build um, both an infrastructure that is fit for purpose, but also to um, ensure that um, we're not going to lock ourselves in patterns of unsustainable development. Um, I'll Thank stop you. here and, and pass, <laughs> pass it on. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to my colleagues for, for telling you the, the really big picture here and thinking on a global scale. Um, my role with the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries is to try and figure out how the New South Wales primary industry sector can contribute to the New South Wales goal of reaching uh, net zero emissions by 2050. And we thought that was challenging when our agriculture sector contributes 9% of our emissions. In New Zealand, you have nearly 50% of your emissions coming from your agriculture sector. So that, to me, is the big challenge that 
you have here in New Zealand in relation to climate and the land. Uh, so the scale of the problem. And then the fact that climate change is continuing to get worse despite 30 years of the IPCC. Unfortunately, the uh, concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere is continuing to increase. So that is, gonna, that is imposing increasingly greater challenges to the agriculture sector in terms of the capacity of our agricultural systems to actually survive and be productive and produce high quality products under increasing climate, uh, increasing temperatures, increasing uh, extreme events, increasing drought in Australia in particular. Um, and so, uh, and also soil carbon, for example, will, will decompose more rapidly in, in a warmer climate. So, so to me, they, those are the major challenges that are here for you as primary producers. I imagine some of you are primary producers here um, in New Zealand. But at the same time, there are opportunities because the measures that you take to try to reduce emissions in agriculture are actually going to increase sustainability of agriculture. If you're um, leaching less nitrate, producing less nitrous oxide, then you're wasting less of your nitrogen fertiliser. If there's less methane being produced by your ruminant animals, then that's less of the food energy that you're wasting. Um, there are various opportunities such as uh, in bioenergy or biochar that could contribute to reducing emissions from the agriculture sector. And I hope we get a chance to talk a bit more about some of those, but I think it's time for Tim to talk. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning, or good evening, as the time zone might <laughs> dictate. You've travelled a long way. <laughs> <laughs> um, most land on a global basis is used for the production of food, but on a global basis equally, our food systems are failing us. They're driving climate change, about a third of greenhouse gases are associated with food production, and this in turn is driving impacts upon yields, making yield uh, growth more difficult. Intensive agriculture on a global basis is driving environmental degradation, air quality, water quality, uh, loss of soil, loss of biodiversity, um, uh, chopping down rainforests and so on. But perhaps most importantly in this context, our food systems are driving global ill health. Now less than 50% of the world's population is of a healthy weight. Less than 50% of the world's population. A single disease associated with poor diets, type 2 diabetes, costs more on a global basis than the entire agricultural economy generates. So it's very clear from my perspective as a food systems person that our food system is unsustainable in its current way, and business as usual is not an option. So there's a huge opportunity here that I can see it. If we, instead of concentrating on agricultural production and the efficiency of agricultural production, we concentrate on the efficiency of the food system, providing healthy diets in a sustainable way, and also profits to the producers, we can have a food system that uses less land, that creates less ill health, and creates less waste. And that can potentially leave space for us to mitigate climate change by afforestation or other land uses. We could afford, if we were using less food, overeating less food on a global basis, wasting less food on a global basis, we could afford to grow food in a much more sustainable way. So the opportunity for me is to convert the vicious cycle that we're driving the land very hard, degrading the land, making growing yields more difficult, but we are growing the yields to make us ill through overconsumption and to throw food away because it's so cheap, to convert that vicious circle into a virtuous circle where we grow food primarily to make people healthier, we get the economics right, we use less land, we waste less food, and we free up land to deal with the climate change. So for me, the opportunity is to switch to a food system that works for people around the world, rather than a food system that doesn't work and externalizes a huge amount of costs, both to us as people and to the planet as a whole. Thank you all. You can see that there's, <laughs> it's gonna be a good discussion. Um, if I picked up on just some of the things you said um, last, this n need to use land for dealing with climate change. And this is all in the context of if we are serious to keep average global warming under two degrees, which we have agreed to under the Paris Agreement. So if that is the goal, then 
land, we will need to use it for both, for growing food and for growing bioenergy crops or some way of stripping carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So going in a way beyond zero, beyond bringing carbon em um, dioxide emissions down to zero, but actually actively stripping it back out of the atmosphere. But when I think of land use and agriculture and transformations of agriculture, there's also the other aspect of the emissions that are not carbon dioxide that are produced through the agricultural processes. So could we use those two aspects as two blocks to discuss? And if I started you off with bioenergy, is there land at the moment that we could simply use for bioenergy crops without having to take over land that's used for food production? Could there not be a win-win in this? <laughs> Go for it. Absolutely. Um, there's plenty of land around the world, unfortunately, that is contaminated, often as a result of mining. And this isn't suitable land for growing food crops, but it's very suitable for growing biomass crops because they're only going to go into a power station or, or what have you. And, and, um, and so, uh, in fact, it can be a remediation option. It's been used in Sweden uh, to soak up heavy metals and then make the land after the bioenergy crops actually suitable for food crops. So although this, you know, there's a limited supply of that type of land, um, it's certainly a prospect. Also yeah, just that. do um, please pick up from each other, yeah. Yeah, so we don't always need to think about it as either or because we can use um, waste products from some industries as inputs into, into bioenergy, so from forestry, for example, or other crops you can grow and use the byproducts from them as inputs into bioenergy, so you're not, it's not either food or energy. But that would be saving, that would be reducing emissions and saving emissions. But if you think of having to grow something that actively increases the amount of CO2 that's taken up by plants, do we have room for that? And is it only forest? Do we need to plant forests or are there other, other bioenergy options? <laughs> well, well, there's, there's options for building soil carbon and, and increasing the amount of carbon stored in forests in the... <laughs> on the land, but the option that uh, is foreseen, at least by some, to be uh, uh, offering negative emissions is the one of growing biomass and using that biomass for bioenergy and then capturing the CO2 that's emitted and putting that underground, so-called geosequestration. And although there are concerns about growing a lot of biomass and there are also concerns about geosequestration, and putting the two things together might sound a bit scary, that is seen as one of the more viable prospects for a technology that's actually available today to deliver the amount of negative emissions that are foreseen to be needed to meet a climate target. The problem is that we just have not succeeded in reducing the fossil fuel use and therefore the rate that we're putting CO2 into the atmosphere. So the climate science who are scientists who are trying to model how we could possibly meet a 2 degree, let alone a 1.5 degree target, are expecting that we will need substantial amounts of BECS bioenergy linked to carbon capture and storage, with all sorts of implications that might have. Would, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm by background an evolutionary ecologist, and uh, evolution has worked fantastically to create this natural carbon storage mechanism, which is called trees. <laughs> and given our food system is under 50% efficient, one way of sucking carbon out of the atmosphere is to plant, plant trees. And there is plenty of scope for making our food system more efficient and providing land that could be used for afforestation. Um, I think the issue of the bioenergy is much more secondary to the issue of the carbon capture by, by trees. But I think there is scope to a forest in ways that we haven't considered because we use land so wastefully to produce food that we just throw into a land, landfill because it's so cheap that it's wasteable. Would you like to respond to it? Yeah, yeah just, just to say that um, I think in the case of Africa, it's more about um, the vast amount of land that would, we would need, especially in terms of arable land. I mean, the countries are doing different things, and I'm not um, certain whether it's just about um, the whole aspects of um, you know, bioenergy as a potential you know, mitigation sort of um, source. Um, Countries like in Ethiopia, for instance, uh, are doing quite a lot um, with um, afforestation and reforestation um, sort of programs um, because these are countries that are losing as much as 90 sort of thousand hectares um, of 
forest um, a year. Um, so they do have an interest in ensuring that land is rehabilitated um, in ways that would um, support uh, many of the farming practices, but also support um, livelihoods. Um, so I think, um, I think that um, in, in specifically in the case of Africa, you know, one needs to look at it more um, from the perspective of how can we grow enough food <laughs> to mm. feed ourselves. Um, mainly because this is another region that is very much dependent on imported food. Much of what we grow also is um, food that we grow and we don't add value. So other people are making a profit on food that we grow where we could also add value um, to, that, to that food. So I think that that, that for us is the, Im the immediate um, sort of urgency because um, our emissions um, you know, um, uh, footprint is actually quite low. Uh, and most people will tell you that Africa is already quite, um, quite green. It's a green field. Um, so I think that the important um, thing for us is how do we ensure that we can maximize on arable land that would support um, our food systems, but also would um, support our livelihood um, um, prospects as well. Is there any perspective um, coming from perhaps the New Zealand Australian angle, given that you know primary production different to Africa is not necessarily f to to feed everybody on those countries, but but primary production is still the backbone of the export industries. Do you have any perspectives coming from, from this region? On you know, land use for growing food versus bioenergy? Well, I guess, yeah, I mean, I wanted to make the point that I did about it doesn't have to be either or. And I think there are some interesting developments looking at taking the advantage, the opportunity of these challenges that we're facing to move towards transforming the systems that we've got. So there's, there's um, initiatives around a bioeconomy or a circular economy type approach where instead of um, large focus on dairy production, for example, um, or monoculture, we have more diversity in our landscape and we're using, as I said, the inputs as, or the outputs into inputs into other industries. So we're kind of using that opportunity to, as a transformation. Um, in New Zealand, we have quite a lot of land, so that conflict between energy and food isn't as acute as it is in Africa. And in some ways, you know, we're, we're, at a, we're in a luxurious position to, to have that. Uh -huh. I know it's not necessarily going to help New Zealand's aspirational goal for net zero, but if you look at the carbon footprint of New Zealand produce compared to produce, the same, the same products grown, let's say dairy in New Zealand versus dairy coming from housed cattle in Europe that are fed entirely on concentrates, you'll see that the carbon footprint of the product from New Zealand, even if it is transported across the planet, is still lower. So I think there's uh, at least a valid argument in saying that New Zealand should be allowed to grow clean, green, low carbon lamb and milk for some of the rest of the world to share. <laughs> now, let me change tag slightly um, and pick up on that idea of transforming agriculture and perhaps talk about the emissions that come from agriculture mostly from livestock, and here I'm thinking not carbon dioxide, but methane and nitrous oxide. Can we discuss that a little bit? What scope is there to change that to reduce these emissions? Whoever wants to get started, I... Um, Go. <laughs> um, there's all sorts of interesting ways, uh, and a lot of them have been developed in New Zealand. There's been some really interesting research done on how you can reduce methane emissions from ruminant livestock by various feed additives, vaccines, um, methane inhibitors that are fed or injected or whatever you do with them. Um, there's also um, developments in breeding and just basically better herd management to reduce your uh, less productive animals in the herd and to get your animals to, to slaughter faster so that you produce less emissions per unit of product. Um, 
in terms of nitrous oxide, nitrous oxide is a problem because it's about 300 times worse than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas, and it's released from the soil from nitrogen fertiliser and also from um, animal excreta. Um, but there are some interesting prospects with biochar, for example, which has shown quite, quite good promise uh, in reducing nitrous oxide emissions from soil. Uh, just more sensible nitrogen fertiliser timing, because um, nitrous oxide is produced when the soil is moist. Uh, so if you time your fertiliser applications, say splitting your applications, then you can reduce the amount of nitrous oxide you produce as well. So that's, that's almost like precision agriculture to use things only when they're really needed and improve the application of fertiliser and things like that? But, but I, would, I would like to just point out the risk associated with thinking only about efficiency of production because there was a Victorian economist called William Stanley Jevons who pointed out that if you made coal-fired power stations more efficient, you would expect to use less coal. But what happened during the Industrial Revolution is you made coal-powered fires, coal fired power stations more efficient and people use more coal because it made energy cheaper and certainly in this whole area the more efficient we make production that doesn't mean we produce less it means it becomes more profitable profitable to produce more so the whole area is full of these spillover effects that the more efficient we make things the cheaper the product becomes so the more gets consumed and so although emissions intensity per unit of milk or, or meat is decreasing, it does mean that the emissions, the total emissions of the sectors tend to increase. And so it becomes an issue, an issue about how the market intensifies and incentivizes production and whether or not we should be paying the realistic environmental and health costs of what we eat or whether we the market subsidises some of these costs in the name of the production growth of the local agricultural economy and passes on some of these costs to either the health sector or the environmental sector and so on. So I'd just be cautious so, a little bit about just thinking about carbon footprints per unit. So are you product. arguing for scaling down agricultural production or moving...? Well. Uh, let me put it, I, I don't want to be emotive in, in this regard, but, but production of meat is polluting, it's creating greenhouse gas. It is creating negative consequences for local environments and production of the wrong sort of food is impacting on diets. If we don't deal with it, in the long run, over generations, we make the situation worse. And so... It comes down from an ecological perspective. How much can we drive the planet before it makes things difficult to live? And although we're quite comfortable at the moment, we're starting to see the prospect of climate disruption, environmental degradation, soils, biodiversity loss, all reaching those points where in 50 years' time, if we carry on as we are, we could be in quite a painful situation. So if the answer is not in technology, the answer has got to be in some form of we can only produce so much. How do we apportion that amongst our populations? Okay. I think the other panellists might want to respond. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I wanted to come back again in terms of just emphasising the, the point about um, the, the, the vantage point, the, the emphasis tends to shift a little bit when it comes to the particular case of Africa, because I'm, I'm hearing a lot about the need to avoid emissions. And I'm not saying that that's not important. I'm just saying that um, if in the process of doing agriculture better, you can avoid, you know, emissions um, in livestock or um, by sort of modern forms of agriculture, that's, that's a good thing. Um, but at the same time, I'm saying what we need to do is to walk towards a better, better modern forms of agriculture, irrigated agriculture. Um, you know, agriculture that probably uses less fertilizers. Um, but at the same time, we have to be able to um, invest a bit more in this area in a way, as I said, that would support... Um, that would support growth. Because at the end of the day, if we want to go towards industrialization of any form, 
agriculture is the gateway. It's the, it's the conduit that would allow us to, to go towards industrialization. And those processes are now being greatly put up by other things that are happening. We, we talked about um, migration, you know, demography, rapid urbanization. So those, those are all processes um, that I think um, are, are not supporting the kind of agricultural practices that we would want to work, to, to work towards. So for me, um, it's less about the, the emission side of it, but more about how do you engage in better agronomic practices, agricultural practices that would support a wider food production um, a, and, and, a, and a food production at a scale uh, that we don't have to import food um, and that we don't have to be dependent in a continent that, that is so large um, and that has so much in the way of arable, um, arable land. You, yep, either both of you. Yep. Yeah, come. Yeah, I mean, I think the contexts are quite different, but in New Zealand we also, and in other developed countries, need to be making our systems, um, you know, more, more efficient and reducing, not only reducing our emissions, but getting those other benefits. But I guess I just wanted to return to the question about reducing, how we can reduce emissions, and also touching on the consumption issue, because we haven't really talked about um, individual behaviours, and also the governance and the policy around this. And I think unless you have that, um, all the research that New Zealand does, which is fantastic, around understanding emissions from agriculture, um, and how we can reduce them, unless farmers are taking these up, um, and unless there's a, a direction at a high level, uncertainty about the policy, things aren't going to change. So we need to keep that in perspective um, when we're talking about these issues, and also about consumption. It comes down to individual behaviours, um, but there's also probably a role for policy there too. Ned? Certainly, because it isn't like farmers are to blame for the emissions and the whole of society is demanding these products that produce the emissions. And I know Tim didn't actually say this, but sometimes uh, being told that uh, ruminant livestock are a problem leads to a conclusion that perhaps we shouldn't have them on the planet. And I just want to make sure that people are aware that about 70% of the farmland of the planet is not able to be cropped or shouldn't be cropped because it's too steep, it's too arid, or the soil is too fragile. And ruminant livestock are actually really cleverly designed. You know, they can eat grass and we can't. Um, they can harvest it themselves. Uh, and so, and they produce uh, a really high value protein uh, that's more balanced in terms of its amino acid balance than most plant proteins. So it's actually really sensible to use the land that's suitable for grazing, for grazing cattle and sheep and goats. Um, and when we think about the cropping land, people want to increase soil carbon and they want to use natural organic fertilisers from manure, um, which tends to come from livestock. So it actually makes sense to be promoting a mixed cropping livestock system that's going to build soil carbon when you have a pasture phase, it's going to increase the sustainability of your cropping. And, uh, and so livestock really do have a valid role in a cropping system. Um, I'm sure we could all share the meat more widely uh, and more e equitably across the planet and we'd all benefit from that, but we don't need to do without altogether. And I guess the, the line between you know, relying on livestock for livelihood is quite a close connection for a lot of people globally, the direct dependence on that. The, I think Tim wants to respond to all that, but let me just briefly, but and um, I'd like to hear from you sort of I'll let you respond first, but I'd also like to cut to the chase and just ask you for a local perspective on expansion of dairy in a New Zealand context, whether you spoke a lot about diversity. You know, have we reached a limit here? Should we return to something that's a bit more diverse? But let, let me to respond first, and then we'll try and... So, um, so I, I just wanted to... Local focus. I just wanted to say, um, as an ecologist... Livestock have a really important role in many ecosystems. And I mean, you can't think about the savannas in Africa without thinking about the sorts of animals which we now have dom domesticated for, for livestock. So it's really important, but equally, to start addressing the other part, there are limits on a global basis to how much climate change we can cope with, and the Paris Agreement codifies those limits. And if the livestock sector more or less by itself, could drive us over the Paris Agreement, 
we have a problem for society as a whole. If we are to maintain our emissions profile on a global basis, it says something about how much totally we can produce. And whether New Zealand produces all of the livestock products in the world and no one else does, or whether those are shared around from country to country, what cannot happen in a sustainable way is for New Zealand to say, we're going to continue growing our livestock. And for the UK to say, we're going to continue growing our livestock. And for the US to say, we're going to continue growing our livestock. Because collectively, that will mean that we break the Paris Climate Agreement. And we are in deep doodah, then, as a species. And the planet is going to, go, going to suffer. So some, somewhere, the economics, the market incentives are all wrong if they are driving every country to say we must produce more and more and more for our economy. So there's nothing wrong with producing stuff for livelihoods, but our economic system is rewarding the wrong sorts of production in the wrong sorts of ways because it is creating the situation where the costs to producing are not being taken into account and those costs are levied on a global basis. Could Could I, and this is probably going to be the last discussion we have before I open up to the audience, but could I just pick up on what Annette said, that there is land that's optimal for one particular use and there could be livestock and there's land that's optimal for another use. Is it possible to think about this from beginning with the land itself? What, this, what a particular patch of land offers without, with the least intervention, with least fertiliser use, with least additional effect? I'm just going to tie this in with your kind of question you alluded to earlier about um, expansion or, or whatever of dairy farming yeah. in New Zealand. And I think that's exactly the point. I mean, I think we need to work with the climate that we've got and the conditions that we've got and how they might change in the future. So doing it where it's suitable for the soil, the topography and the climate, the water availability, working within those limits. So it comes back to yeah, using the land that's appropriate, whether it's Hill, hill land for sheep and beef or, or trees. Um, so, yeah, just being a bit sensible about where we put things. Um, and also, I did want to add to Tim's um, point that we need to, I think, in New Zealand, certainly look at balancing the benefits and the costs around our production. So, who gets the benefits and who bears the costs? Mm -hmm. Did you want to add to it? I was just going to comment that maybe it doesn't quite work in New Zealand, but certainly in Australia, the CSIRO has just done a report for the meat and livestock industry that's demonstrated how uh, red meat production in Australia can become carbon neutral. I think it's by 2030. I don't know the details. The report hasn't been published yet, but that's what they say. Yeah, um, just a point which I've not, um, I've not heard, actually, um, in our discussions is about um, the knowledge that we need to address some of these problems. I, I have a sense that um, much of the knowledge will have to be knowledge that is sourced locally. Um, and I also worry that um, the people that we need to draw this knowledge from are very often um, um, sort of um, marginalised in the sense that we're not tapping um, the knowledge that we need from these people. Um, one example is... Um, you know, there are more and more people that are becoming dis displaced because of problems related to land. Um, in Ethiopia, for instance, one could say that about close to 8 million people are being displaced um, as a result of drought and land degradation. Um, because they displace, it means that we're not necessarily... Um, these people that are custodian of, 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 of this knowledge... Um, very often indigenous knowledge, we're not tapping that knowledge from them. Um, and therefore, we're not using them in the way that we, we should um, to enable us to go back to a renewal process of um, understanding what we need to do to make land produce and work better for us. So I think that there is a real asymmetry in terms of the people that are there that can actually tap, that we can tap into, that we're not necessarily tapping into that knowledge. Um, that can support um, 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 productivity or can support, um, you know, farming processes. So, so I think that's a, that's another that's a real shame. But another very quick problem um, I wanted to mention is that we in Africa do have this problem about 
not valuing our ecosystems, not, not understanding the real cost um, of ecosystems. Um, and I think that when we're not able to do that, we're not able to appreciate um, what we're losing in terms of forests, what we're losing in terms of depletion, um, be that in um, different ecosystems um, depletion. We're not able to, to put that in quantitative terms. Um, and so governments are not able to make policies based on, you know, this is how much that has been depleted a year and this is what it means to the um, economy of this country or that country. So I think we need to get better um, at understanding how these things how much these things cost and how, how you know, the, the cumulative cost of not being able to understand and able to appreciate these things um, are, um, you know, going to affect, um, affect our livelihoods but also affect um, the way in which we can use them potentially as solutions. Yeah. Now, I'm looking at you all. Are there any questions from the audience? There's a hand up. Do we have microphones? So there's one... Two, three, four. Okay, so let's start. Thank you for um, a wonderful panel discussion. Um, this is a question for Tim. I was really interested in picking up on your comment about waste. I, I agree with you completely about um, the issue of waste. And perhaps naively, I think that probably on a global scale, quite a significant amount of the waste is through transport of food from one place to another. And I wonder if that is true how that could possibly be reduced or what suggestions you might have to reduce the waste. Yes, if you... Um, the amount that's lost during transport is actually... Transport processing and retail is, is actually quite small. The majority of waste either occurs on farm and in early stage storage or at the point of consumption, whether in service or whether in the home. And those two components between them are about three quarters of the waste and what's lost en route, because clearly it's in business's interest to minimize waste, because that's where their profit goes. Whereas in the home, because food is relatively cheap, we tend to stock up, fill our fridge, find something slimy a week later and throw it out, and that becomes an economically rational thing to do, because most of us in most of the world can afford to do that sort of thing. And likewise, in the retail industry, big portion size, you know, for some cultures, actually leaving food on the plate is, is to show that you've appreciated the meal and you couldn't eat any more. And so, you know, waste is a bit of a cultural issue as well. Great. Can we have a question? There was two, yeah, there's a few questions in this corner, so if we could start with you. Thank you. I've got a great deal of respect for what the IPCC has done over many years, and I understand what you've said about gathering all the good information that you can. Um, something that concerns me is that I hear you folk talking about the need for um, direction from above, the need for good policy, uh, the need for, well, I think it was Tim who said, you know, the market settings are all wrong. So my question really to all of you is, are you satisfied after all this work has taken place and you make your report and you can only make uh, options available. Are you satisfied with that next upper process of getting it into policy and getting it into the politicians? Would, would, would you like to answer that or should I put it to Jim Skeet? <laughs> Can I quickly answer? Yeah, sure. So, so, so um, it was alluded to earlier, I, I used to be a cross-government UK advisor around food and my title was champion for food because that's kind of ambassadorial and not dictatorial. And it is really, really difficult because policy is made for a multiple set of pragmatic reasons. But I fully agree with you. In our government cycles, I can't, I'm saying this as a person, I'm not, certainly not saying this as IPCC member, uh, author. Um, the electoral cycle drives very short-termism. And what we're talking about is long-termism. And it's not in anybody's interest who's in a political office at the moment, really, to say we will take a hit now to save things in 20 or 30 years' time. So, so there is a pragmatism about, and to a certain extent, I think many of us feel, as academics and experts, feel a frustration that we could do things better. But then every intervention that can be made is, is typically wicked in some dimensions. So eating better 
and eating differently is a very good thing from a global economic perspective, but the people who produce the food at the moment that people eat would get hurt and they'd get frightened and the Cargills of this world and the Monsantos of this world would lose power and incumbency and so on. So every intervention is wicked and that makes it really difficult from a political perspective because there are winners and losers in, in everything. But if we can think of a better way of, of managing our democracies, then please say, it would be lovely to know. <laughs> okay, can we take one or two more questions and then we'll have to start wrapping up. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question for Tim and for Anit. Uh, for Tim, um, I liked it when you said we have to look at improving productivity per unit area vis-a-vis -vis opening more land to, cre to create, to grow more food. But when you talk about productivity, that means um, increasing productivity, that means improving technologies, using fertilizers, improved seeds and the like. When shall we draw the line? Because when we use fertilizers and those other things, then we bring about land degradation. And we are talking about land degradation vis-a-vis -vis food security. So I don't know, when do we draw the line? Then for Annette, I liked it when you talked about the methane inhibitors. Methane inhibitors that we give to livestock to avoid livestock emitting methane in the atmosphere. And I was just wondering, that can easily be done in closed systems like zero grazing. How applicable is it to the open systems? Well, since New Zealand has mainly open systems, are you, how are you doing it? Because I want to copy it for Africa. Thank you. All right, just very quickly, because I realize as a token male, I'm dominating like males tend to do. Um, improving productivity, I would say the key thing is improve profitability in whatever sense, not productivity. Whatever mar sort of market you're in, it's about getting what you need. Uh, too much of our productivity improvement has led to increased waste and increased ill health Im impacts. What we want to do is make sure that farmers get a fair price for a product that is good for society as a whole. Um, so, so for me, a lot of it's around improving food system efficiency and not just thinking about how can we grow ever more and more. There is no point in growing using precious water, precious soil, precious, precious nitrogen, growing food to make us ill or to throw away. So it's getting the system right and the efficiency of the system right. Um, could we have one super short, short, short question? Because I have to bring this to a close. There was a question for me, but I could always answer That's it later. That is true. That is true. Um, I, actually, in my chapter, which is the land degradation chapter, we are going to write about the limits to sustainable intensification. So the, the question you were just asking. Um, because certainly in many places there are uh, prospects of closing a yield gap, but it might require some fertiliser. And it actually makes sense to do so if that means you can farm less land area to produce the same amount of yield. Um, but in relation to the methane inhibitors, um, some of them are feed additives, which obviously are not really viable if you're in an extensive grazing system. But the New Zealanders are also working on a vaccine. Uh, and I'm sure Andy will be happy to tell you about it later. Um, and, and biochar is something that somebody in Western Australia is feeding to his cattle in some sort of a lick. So he just puts it out in the paddock. They help themselves. Then the biochar is in the room and then it ends up in the manure. And he's also added dung beetles. So the dung beetles bury it in the ground and it's uh, increasing his soil carbon. So maybe Maybe there's an opportunity there too. Now, I'm going to have to bring this to a close. I'm sorry, there might be a way of perhaps filing your questions. I, yes, the University of Canterbury might do a science block where some of the outstanding questions could be answered and then published there. So hold on to them and let us know. Let me know, let Bronwyn, uh, Bronwyn Hayward know. Um, but I'm going to have to bring this to a close. And um, thank you, the audience, for your insightful questions. Thanks to our panellists for this time that they've taken. And for closing remarks and a vote of thanks, let me introduce two final speakers. First, Dr. Yuba Sokona. Vice Chair of the IPCC with more than 35 years of experience in addressing energy, environment, sustainable development issues in Africa. And following that, we'll have a few bits of thanks from Dr. Andy Reisinger, who's the Deputy Director International for the New Zealand Agricultural Greenhouse Gas Research Centre. Thank you all.
Thank you. Uh, it is not easy and then to uh, speak after this uh, very interesting debate and a discussion. But it uh, uh, gives to us that we are in a right, uh, we, we take the right decision and then to work on this special report for a number of reasons. And we could say climate and land. And that will not show, uh, explain the complexity of the problem, the issue we are dealing with. And it's important, that is why there is a long title. And then to make sure that we'll be addressing the various issues. What appears in the discussion is that we have to deal with two tensions, the local and the global. And then if you look at only the global aspect, you miss out completely the, the, the local issues. That is the whole element of bioenergy issues. Bioenergy is addressing the global issue, and that we forget completely the local. This one tension we need to deal with. The second tension is related to the short-term and longer-term perspective, and that is exactly addressing the policy questions, because if we address only the mitigation perspective, we address the longer-term perspective, and then work, we are not working in the time frame of the policy makers. And by looking at all the different elements of the land, and then we will be investing in the short-term perspective on the local issues at the same time to make it compatible with the long-term and then with the global. And those are some of the complexity we are confronted in embarking in this report. And I think that this is important. It's important that each of the speakers starts saying that there's opportunities. In each of the contexts, if you look at the global, you look at the local, you look at the African context, New Zealand context, UK context, there's a wide range of opportunities. That means we have a clear vision of what needs to be done. We have a clear vision of what to do. And then the real question in which we are investing in this report is how to make possible that all those pieces uh, will be able to bring together. And in the past report, we addressed fragmentally some of those different issues in a specific context of each of the working groups. On the science perspective, on the mitigation perspective, on the adaptation perspective. And this report is bringing all those different pieces together so that we will be addressing, we will be bringing to exactly the question you address to the policy makers. Our role, it is not to control or to recommend or to direct the policy decision, is to inform. So that bringing the element of reducing this tension of investing in the local at the same time in the global, make them compatible. Investing in the short term and the long term, make them compatible. Certainly, and then investing also on the uh, uh, responses options in a much more holistic manner than a global or local manner will lead the policymaker to engage in action that is needed. And then those are, and then thank you also for organizing this side event. This discussion is timely because we just discussed the zero order draft of our report where a number of questions uh, that has been raised during this uh, event will fit in the process we'll be taking. And thank you again. Thank you. It now falls to me to bring this um, exciting discussion to a close. First of all, let me thank again the, the panel speakers um, who've given up their time that they maybe should have spent, maybe wanted to spend continuing to work on their chapters for this report. We're <laughs> deeply grateful for your time. By the way, progress reports still due 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. Um, I'd also, the IPCC is an organization that's used to being under intense scrutiny. It believes in transparency, declaration of con conflict of interest, so I would like to very publicly thank my wife, Veronica, <laughs> for doing um,
for doing an excellent job sharing this really interesting discussion. IPCC work is so bad we have to appear in the same panel discussion to see each other. Um, um, I thought the discussion was really interesting. The main message I'm taking for New Zealand is we're not alone. And I don't mean the green alien things, but um, we, we will have an intense discussion around the role of the land sector in New Zealand over the next year, two years, 10 years, 20 years. And while maybe five years ago, New Zealand often didn't quite embrace those discussions out of the sense that we're on our own. Nobody understands us. Nobody shares our pain. As you heard out of the panel discussion, out of the fact that the IPCC is producing a special report on land, we're not alone. We're, we're part of a global community that seeks to engage with those options. It doesn't make, make the solutions easy. As, as Uber reminded us, there's always a, an interface, a trade-off between local and global solutions. New Zealand has to develop its local solutions that, that are consistent with the role it wishes to play in a global context. So with that, I would like to thank you again, thank Jim and Yuba for giving opening and closing remarks, and thank you very much for coming. I do want to just thank the various sponsoring organizations. This evening was supported by the New Zealand Agricultural Greenhouse Gas Research Center, University of Canterbury, and the Royal Society of New Zealand. The entire fact that we have 120 of the world's experts available in Christchurch to work on this important report is thanks to support provided by the New Zealand Ministries for Environment, Foreign Affairs and Trade, and Primary Industries. Um, also, very warmly appreciate the support from Te Runanga on Naitahu and um, Tenai, um, Tenai to Ahuriri Runanga, as well as University of Canterbury, um, and lest I forget anybody, Christchurch City Council, of course, <laughs> who've been very generous. It's been driven by very strong support through Bronwyn Hayward, and last but Definitely not least, Sylvia Nissen, who held all the strings together to actually bring all those events to fruition. So thank you very much, and I hope we go forward with new energy.